Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to this very special event uh, co-hosted by the Mitchell Museum of the American Indian in Evanston, Illinois, and the Museum of Native American History in Bentonville, Arkansas. I am Mary Smith. I'm the Interim Executive Director of the Mitchell Museum, and I'm an enrolled member of the Cherokee Nation. Uh, and with me today are the Executive Director of the Museum of Native American History, Charlotte Buchanan Yale, and our special, special guest, Johnny Dicott. <laughs> so, <laughs> I know. Um, well, this is a very special event. Uh, we are so pleased to be collaborating with um, the Museum of Native American History in Bentonville, Arkansas, and with Johnny Daikon, who's a, such a renowned artist. And I have to say for myself, it's a very special event, too, because we're going to be talking uh, a lot about Johnny's works, but we'll start, I think, talking about the new mural that was unveiled at uh, Mona last week. And we are the first event since the unveiling to talk about it outside of Bentonville, Arkansas. And it's a mural of the Trail of Tears and it has personal significance to me. Uh, I'm an enrolled member of the Cherokee Nation and I know that my ancestors were in the Trail of Tears and ended up in um, actually Westville, Oklahoma, which is just over the um, Arkansas border in Oklahoma. So uh, such a great, great, um, I'm so glad that we're here tonight. So before we get started, I just wanted to introduce our special guest. Uh, Charlotte Buchanan Yale is the uh, incomparable <laughs> executive director of the Museum of Native American History in Bentonville, Arkansas. And um, I was, re she has a very diverse background and has been working with artists uh, her entire career. Uh, I think she also, um, uh, I read one article, uh, I think she said she arrived at the museum the same time as um, uh, a prehistoric animal. So she <laughs> judges her years in, in those kind of years, but she, I believe, started in 2014. So we are so pleased. I am so glad to be collaborating with her. She's been such an amazing um, colleague and friend that I'm uh, so pleased to work with. And then we have Johnny Daikon. He's an enrolled member of the Muskegee uh, Creek Nation of Oklahoma. He received his post high school education in art at Peconi College in Muskegee, Oklahoma, where he studied the flat style of Indian painting under master artist Ruth Laylock Jones. And so he also um, graduated from the Institute of American Indian Arts located in Santa Fe, New Mexico, where he focused on a contemporary style of Indian art. So he, his art is very eclectic and blends both um, traditional flat style and contemporary styles. And you'll hear more about that from uh, Johnny himself tonight. So uh, with that brief introduction, um, I wanted to start with, uh, and, and we are so pleased because um, Johnny and Charlotte are actually sitting in the Museum of Native American History in Bentonville, Arkansas, um, near where the mural was unveiled last week. And I will um, start with Charlotte. Um, tell us a little bit about how this whole mural came about. Well, I always want to bring Johnny into everything we do, as well as you. Um, we, we have more to talk about after this. But uh, we are doing a joint exhibit with Crystal Bridges, a Museum of American Art, a collaborative effort called Companion Species, We Are All Related. And uh, we always have a spotlight artist. And of course, I'm going, I'm kind of like Lucy and Ethel with Johnny. I'm always going to, you know, you know, highlight Johnny whenever I can. And we, we had scheduled it in November and life happens and COVID happens and, you know, ice storms happen and it landed for the perfect day last week. It was clear skies, gorgeous, speechifying at its best. And, um, so, and also this is, that was the first event we've done in a whole year since we've been shut and we just reopened. What a special event to kind of get back in the swing of things. Yes. Um, 
Well, and then um, Johnny, tell me about, um, you know, what this project has meant to you. Well, you know, I, I felt very uh, honored, uh, you know, to be able to do this, to be asked to be do this, you know, and then uh, just also the privilege, the honor to be able to represent our people um, for this commemorative piece. It, it, it means a lot to me, and I know it means a lot to uh, many people because, uh, you know, it's this artwork is it's bigger than me. It's an event that's bigger than me, and it represents a, a lot of people. And that's why I, I felt very honored that I was, first of all, given this gift to be able to do this, and then the honor and the privilege to be able to, to be asked to use this gift to do this. And so it's, it was very important. I felt like it was a piece that, that needed to be done and, and people need to see it and understand the history of it and to know why uh, things are the way they are today and you know how it came to be this and how we ended up where we're at in Oklahoma from our homelands in the Southeast. Exactly. Well, should we uh, 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 let people see what the mural looks like? Yes. One thing I want to say is that when we talked about bringing Johnny in as uh, back in November, this mural could not be rushed because it's powerful. And um, it really, I was looking at Johnny's beautiful artwork and I saw a print he had of the Trail of Tears and I just knew it was supposed to happen that way because the museum is sitting on one of the fingers of the Trail of Tears. Well, and then, and then since you mentioned that, Charlotte, didn't you, are you now a registered location along the trail now? It is. The synchronicity of this project's incredible. Um, we've always been, uh, what, our, what we do at the museum, it's important that we connect the past, present, and future. And we have uh, a bee in our bonnet to educate future generations about our collective history and uh, humanity. And this is so powerful and we're honored because it starts that conversation, but now it is parlayed into being on the national register with the National Trail of Tears Association. That's so fantastic. So now we put up the actual mural um, on the um, screen for everyone to see. And um, uh, Charlotte, why don't you tell us first before we go to Johnny to talk about the actual uh, content of the mural, but where is this at the museum and but how large is this in, in real life? Well, and it's three panels that are four by eight and it is on, um, uh, it's, uh, it's made to be uh, outside art. It's on uh, metal mural panels with um, his fancy schmancy mural paint that you use, whatever that is. But it, um, we framed it and brought them together. And it's just incredible with the, uh, the light, how it starts the dark and it changes. But it is something that started so many conversations. We had our first tour of kids from Salisaw yesterday. And, you know, I, it's just such an amazing uh, way to have it as a teaching tool. And we're honored. The museum has, um, it's on our south side of our building. And you can't really miss it when you pull into the parking lot. Uh, we have two murals now on the on the museum. One is by J. Nicole Hatfield. That is strong portraits, but this one adds to our educational outreach. That's amazing. This it's so powerful. I mean, I'm just looking at it, Johnny. T just tell us about um, you know your thoughts and your vision for this this piece and how you decided what to put in there and 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 just everything about it. Uh, well, um, when she approached me about doing a mural, I, I wanted to do the Trail of Tears mural. And I based it on a smaller work I'd done a few years ago. It was a uh, two foot by four foot uh, Trail of Tears work. And I don't do too many Trail of Tears work because I, uh, I make part of my money and part of my living as an artist. And I don't like to depict the suffering of my people and make money off of it. So when I do do these pieces, it's always for a specific reason. It's for, a, a, you know, to honor and commemorate more than it is a money-making thing. So I don't do very many of them, so I take it very serious. And it was a very, uh, uh, you know, a lot of thought went into how I wanted to depict this because of the subject matter. So I based it on that painting I did, which is pretty much 
was like the background of that mural. It was just a line of people in the snow with the trees. Um, the people are in the background, um, just a small line of people. Uh, I think there was like 60 people or so. The, you know, each one of them I did, their blankets were different. Each one of them had a different blanket design. And I did this on the mural all the way across too, because these people, even though there's not that many on these paintings, I wanted to kind of make each individual person represent a group of people, a family, or, you know, mm -hmm. and so that's why those blankets are all different because there, there's different stories, there's different families, there's different things. So I stretched that in the background of the mural and I wanted to bring up some, since I'm working on a bigger, bigger, uh, you know, uh, pieces of, of uh, four, four by eight panels instead of a little two by four foot. I wanted to make them bigger and, and bring some of those figures more up close to the viewer and a little more detail, a little more what's going on on the trail. Um, the middle panel, I decided to put, and, and these are fairly good size. These, these figures are almost four feet tall, the three in the center. Um, to give it that up close feeling, because when you get stand there, look at it, it's almost like you're standing there with them. I mean, you're almost almost eye to eye with them. They're up a little higher than eye level the way it's hung on the wall, but it gives you that feeling because they're kind of a little taller than you are. But you know, bring that viewer into that, uh, let them feel a little bit of that, uh, like they're there with them. And then the and as I went across, I went from a blue sky, and as I went deeper into the panel over toward the toward the right side on the third panel I, I progressed that sky from a blue to a darker to a darker blue purple uh, mixture in there because um, it, it the uh, the feeling and conveying kind of went to a darker and at the very end there's actually a death scene uh, in the third panel and I wanted mm -hmm. to kind of as a, as a design element, it's kind of bring some movement to that also because I didn't want it to be a static line of people, you know, 24 foot line of people, because I wanted to put a little more uh, uh, to get to people's uh, emotions. I wanted to have people feel some, you know, sense and get some little bit of mystery, mystery in it because I didn't show too many people's faces. Um, they're shrouded in blankets. Uh, it also helps uh, let people know that that's cold out there. These people are suffering. They're hunkered over. They're uncomfortable. Um, and I'll, also when I was doing this in my studio at the time, it's uh, I've just got a little heater and we're having to go through like a very fierce cold snap uh, at the time I was working on it and my little heater couldn't keep up. <laughs> Um, so sometimes I'd be out there working in some very cold weather, uh, and uh, yeah, I'd, I'd stay out there as long as I could working on it. And sometimes my fingers would get too cold where I couldn't really hold the paintbrush good enough. But yet sometimes I'd still just stay out there with them because I thought, you know, um, my people went through a lot. And, and I felt kind of bad, uh, you know, oh, I'm cold. I can't stay out here. I'm going to go inside. And I thought, no, I mean, the, the heart of this painting is about the suffering. And so I stayed out there with them. Sometimes I was just sitting out there and just staying with them. And, uh, and the night before I brought it even uh, over to the to the museum, I, I, I sat out there several hours with them and, you know, spent the last few minutes with these people that populate this, this painting because I, I, I got this closeness to them, attachment to them. You know, it was very personal and deep because they represented people, my people, you know, who I came from, relatives and, and friends of, and their relatives and, and, you know, people I interact with every day. Uh, that, that's part of their story. And I think that's why, you know, it's, it's so important these people that see that because they, th those are our relatives, they say, those are our relatives. A lot of people said to me, those are our relatives and that's true. Well, that's amazing, Johnny. 
Um, well, let's take a step back because not everyone on the webinar tonight may know about the history of the Trail of Tears. And I know, um, I think probably there's a number of people that have a misconception. Uh, you hear about the Cherokees being in the Trail of Tears, but the Cherokees were not the only tribe. Your tribe as well, Johnny, was in the trail. In fact, several, several tribes were in the trail. Can, can we talk a little bit about that? Yeah, you know, my tribe, the Muscogee, um, we, were, we were removed from the, our, our homelands in the southeast. We were in Alabama, Georgia, Florida, and that area. Uh, we were removed, Choctaw, Chickasaw, Seminole, um, and that's just the five, and the Cherokee, those are the five major tribes. And within those tribes in that area were smaller tribes um, that people don't think of and, uh, and that were moved to, uh, that came with us. And they're, they're in Oklahoma with us today. And, and uh, you know, the Creek Nation, Muscogee Nation is made up of tribal towns, which are actually individual or tribes. And that's what made up the Muscogee Confederacy. Um, m m the Muscogee people are, are a confederacy of tribes. So there was a lot of tribes that got moved over. If you, th if you look at it in our traditional way, um, there was a lot of tribes moved over from that. Um, you know, Oklahoma is uh, pretty much a, uh, was a concentration camp for tribes. They got moved from all around the country, you know, not just from the Southeast, um, we've got Modoc in northeastern Oklahoma. They're they up on, around the Quapaw Agency, around Miami, Oklahoma. They're uh, they're from California. At one time, Nez Perce from Idaho were located in uh, Oklahoma. They had a reservation there. Um, we've got uh, Peoria, Delaware, Shawnee, Wyandotte, all up in that northeast corner. Um, and a lot of tribes in Oklahoma didn't come from this area. We've got Cheyenne that are, are there, uh, Cheyenne, Arapaho, um, Ponca, Pawnee, Potawatomi. Um, and, you know, it, it was Indian territory. And that's why, because that's where tribes, many tribes were forced removals to these areas. And so, um, and, and in a way, this even, this painting represents all tribes that aren't native to that state's removal to that state. And, you know, in, in a larger sense, there were removals all around this land. The Navajo had removals. Um, it's just uh, this piece encompasses a lot of things, you know, it, it, that's why I say it's an important piece. Um, and, and it gets that conversation going at people who don't know what the Trail of Tears was. They may have heard of the Trail of Tears or they've got a romantic idea from uh, previous paintings done by non-Indians of, you know, the removal and this, but they don't know the whole story behind it, who was involved, uh, you know, uh, you know yeah. a lot of them didn't know Andrew Jackson, uh, President of the United States was behind it and, and uh, you know, the, his predecessor after him, uh, you know, there's a long history, but the, this painting, you know, it sparks that, uh, wanting to know. And that, it's another good thing about this work that it gets that story out there and it, it makes you think and makes people that don't know the history, you know, want to dive into it and find out why, why did this happen to these people? How did this happen? Because we didn't end up in Oklahoma because we thought it'd be a good place, you know, to move, to relocate because better jobs, better weather, you know, like what most people do when they move from, a, from one state to another nowadays. We were forced there. It was a death march, you know, from our ancestral homelands where the Creator put us. After long warfare, we were moved there, and so that's that's. There's a there's a big story behind this painting, and I hope that painting just, you know, lights that spark, and people want to delve into it to to learn more about it. Yes. I hope, um, yeah, I hope that people uh, after watching this want to learn more because there were multiple Trail of Tears, different tenants of it. In fact, um, when I went uh, back to um, uh, uh, Westville, Oklahoma, where my grandmother grew up, where the um, uh, cemetery is, is the end of one of the Trail of Tears there. So, um, Johnny, well, before we move on and talk about some of your other work, tell, tell us, um, you know, what style this is and what kind of paint and, and um, uh, materials you use for this uh, mural. All right, um, 
when I went to Bacon, it was known for a school for what they call it, a flat style of painting. Um, so I learned how to do that. Uh, that was popular uh, from the 20s, uh, 30s, until about uh, the 60s, 70s. It, um, it started to lose favor, uh, not favor, but popularity, I should say. Um, when uh, the Institute of American Indian Arts uh, came about and a more Western view of art came about, a more modern look, it went from the flat uh, 2D style of painting to what, what this is more like. It's um, There's background, there's shadowing. Um, it's what most people recognize when they look at art, but they would recognize as Western style art. Um, I was originally was going to do a, a flat style painting uh, based on a lot of the murals that I'd seen from uh, the WPA uh, native artists such as Woody Crumbo and AC Blue Eagle, um, Dick West, um, guys like that, the old masters who were also uh, former uh, students and uh, art directors at Bay Cone College where I, I studied this flat style. Um, around Oklahoma, um, there's a lot of these murals in buildings. And uh, at Bacon College, there's uh, several large murals there in that style. And that's what I was thinking about doing here, but I decided to go with this style instead. Um, so I, I did some research on the paint since it was going to be outside. I've done murals before, but they've been indoor murals. This is the first outdoor mural. So I decided to research some paint. My father was an old sign painter, old school sign painter, used to hand letter signs. Um, yeah, he started that years ago, but I, I got some of those, uh, ideas because he did outdoor work and I understood that this paint needed to hold up to elements, um, all kinds of weather changes, you know, wind, rain, temperature changes, uh, elements, such as, uh, bacterial growth, mold, anything that happens outdoors. You know, if you painted a house, you know what that house will go through and you have to keep you know, painting it over and over, you know, through the years, scraping paint off. But when you do something like this, like a sign or a mural, you don't want to have to go over there yearly and redo it. So I researched some paint right down to um, what the what the painting is going to go on, some gesso that's specifically formulated for outdoor use, for outdoor mural use. And so it's formulated, it prevents uh, bacterial and mold buildup underneath the paint. And, and moisture protection. Uh, it protects the paint. It, it puts a layer between the, the paint and the substrate or that aluminum panel is what I use to paint on. It's an aluminum sign board. So that'll hold up better than wood. Um, put that gesso on there. And then I use the paint, that's specially formulated UV protection for outdoor mural use. So it won't fade. Um, it's, it's light fast, it's waterproof. And so put that on there. And then after that, I put on uh, three layers of a gloss varnish. Put three layers on that. And then after that, after that dried in it, that was a process for the layers to dry. <laughs> the paint itself was acrylic, so it dried fast, but the varnish takes a little longer to dry. And then I'd have to wait for each layer to dry so it doesn't get cloudy as I apply another layer. So I put three layers of this gloss varnish after they dried, I went back and I put another layer of another varnish that was flat and it has a UV protection. It was a special outdoor varnish that's for use for outdoor work. And I did three layers of that. And the, the plan was hopefully that is enough protection that it should withstand the elements. And I and on the three panels, originally there were, we were talked about painting it directly on the wall. And uh, I came and looked at the wall and, the, and it had a nice texture to be perfect for painting on. But I thought if by any chance something happened to this building, like if the museum had to uh, raise the building to, for an expansion or something, or if something happened to the building, they could lose that mural and it would be gone. And that's what's happened to a lot of the older murals that the older artists have done. Buildings have been uh, torn down or they had to redo something inside the building. And so that mural is gone. Yeah. Other than photographs. So I figured if I do them on panels, if they need to take them down or move them or do whatever they want, or if they want to put them somewhere else, they can do it. 
and I signed each individual panel in case through the years, oh, if they get sorry. separated, there were three <laughs> separate pieces of art. So that's that was the why I signed each each panel just in case. Yeah. And uh, so uh, well, you know, I yeah, that's great. Well, I am. Um, and people, if uh, you have any questions you want to ask Johnny or Charlotte, I think you can put them in the chat or the Q and A. Uh, but since we're talking about your art, Johnny, let's you really have done so many different styles. Uh, let's take a look at some of your other works. Do you want to kind of talk about a little just briefly? I know you've got quite a few here. Okay, uh, this one I did uh, when the pandemic first started. Um, I was I was at home in my studio. I was at first I was kind of worried, so I wasn't really in the mood to create art. But after about a week, I was wondering, you know, where's this pandemic going? What's going to happen? And then I heard that, you know, it was affecting the older people. And I thought, you know, I'm really worried about our older, our elders, because, you know, they're very, very important just because, you know, a lot of them and they're the last bastion of our language. They're, they're our culture keepers, you know. Um, and in many cases, a lot of them are guardians for our younger people, you know. We rely on our grandparents and they're our older people. And when I heard that this was happening, that was affecting them, I, 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 I was worried for them. And, and it moved me to do this painting that you see here. And uh, I just took an older couple and I put the coronavirus is kind of got that uh, bo uh, invasion of the body snatchers feel kind of a sci fi yeah, feel it to it. But uh, that was just the feeling, you know, here is these people and here is this virus. It was just all around. And uh, and, uh, you know, I was still unsure what was going to happen. And that was the first painting I did. And that, that's that's how that one came about. We do actually get we did get one question um, and I don't know if it's in the slideshow. Um, someone asked about the art you did for Joy Harjo's book of poetry. Oh, yeah. So it's in the slideshow. Uh -huh. Yeah. Can we go to that one? Yeah. Um, let's see. There it is. That's that one right there. Yeah, that's one of our it's of a ceremonial the dance. The green corn suite. The green corn suite. Yeah, it's uh, it, there is a. I call it Green Corn Suite because I was doing several different paintings in a series from the Green Corn Ceremony. And uh, this is just one of them I did. It's uh, with some dancers and then the, the the arbor from the ceremonial grounds are in the background. That glow coming off of it, it that. represents a ceremonial fire. Oh, that's great. Well, let's let's take a look at some others. And that one I did. <laughs> if, if you're uh, familiar with Star Trek, the original Star Trek series, um, when I was a little boy, <laughs> we played Star Trek. We didn't play Cowboys and Indians so much. We played Star Trek a lot. And uh, I grew up in a, in a little section of Arkansas here. Well, actually close to here in Springdale. And I was the only Indian kid around. So uh, I always got to play Spock because I had the hair. <laughs> Cut like Spock's, you know, it was straight and black, and so, uh, and I was different than everybody else, so they always had me play Spock, <laughs> and so I thought that was cool because Spock was always smart and he was different, and he always seemed to get him out of trouble. So, <laughs> but the, the, I, I decided I was going to do a painting and I was going to make him use that old Star Trek, the old uh, iconic uniforms, and make him Indian, and I took a rifle that I thought is kid was cool an old phaser rifle that was in like the original it was only in one episode like the original star trek pilot or whatever and uh i thought i love that gun so i put it in there and i ended it up i put a feather on it and and, uh, and i call this one where no indian has gone before and uh, it was my pop pop art native pop art uh piece i love it I love that you do historical, but also very contemporary. Let's let's. Uh, and by the way, um, if you're interested in purchasing some of Johnny's prints, you can do so both at Mona's website and uh, the Mitchell Museum's website. And perhaps we can put up some links links to those. Uh, but let's let's look at a couple more of Johnny's works. And a stickball player, one of our. Uh, that's a big piece there. I forgot how big a 56 by 60 is hanging up in my living room. 
it was an oil painting I did, and, and uh, all natives recognize this one. And they always say, oh, what clinic's that? That's the uh, the IHS waiting room, the Indian Health Service waiting room. And if, if you've ever been in one, that's pretty much what it is. You know, you just sit there for hours at a time with all these Indians. And I was in there one day at one of the clinics waiting to see the doctor. I thought, you know, boy, this would make a great painting, all these broke down Indians sitting here. <laughs> so I did that, and it, people love it. Every, uh, everybody. Yeah, everybody asks which clinic that is. They all say, well, that looks like my clinic because, you know, the, the colors are they're all pretty much the same in a lot of them. <laughs> well, yeah. And well, going back to that IHS waiting room, I actually was the head of IHS, and I can attest that <laughs> I remember walking into the waiting room at Rosebud Hospital, and it was filled. And I said to the uh, CEO of the hospital, "Why, why, why? What are all those people in there for?" And they said, "Oh, they're not." They're not here to see the doctor. They're just here, you know, it's kind of like the Starbucks on the reservation. You know? Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's the meeting place. <laughs> yeah. Uh, let's talk about the next one. Okay, this was a uh, fishing medicine. Was It's a, uh, a devil's shoestring. It's a, it's a root. They dry out, make it into a powder. And it's a neurotoxin. They throw it in the water, and, and then the men would get around and mix it around that's what this guy's doing around the guy with the the the, the drum there stowing it in um i stunned those fish and it, the fish would come up to the surface and it's easy to harvest that way of course it wasn't it wasn't poisonous to you could eat the fish you know it didn't it didn't do any damage that way but uh that was a, one of the one of the methods of fishing and i wanted to do a, a painting showing that and a lot of people that aren't familiar with southeastern ways don't doesn't don't know what that painting means, but uh, Muscogee people see that they they know they know what that is. And they, they really enjoy, and that's why I like doing my paintings of my people so much because we don't see that often enough. And representation is important, you know. And we see a lot of native art, and it's war bonnets and teepees, you know. And, uh, and Muscogee people like to see Muscogee things, and I I feel really really proud. Of, uh, being able to do this and, and represent our people, putting these images out there. And it makes me happy that when they see it, they identify with it. Cause I know growing up, you know, I, I didn't see that so much. And, um, you know, I was used to seeing Indians on, you know, the teepees and the, and the headdresses and stuff. And I appreciated that because I, I knew, I knew those people, you know, I identified with them, but it wasn't, wasn't who I was. And that's why I normally don't do, uh, pieces of other tribes you know there's other artists out there who are of that tribe that do those works and i let them do that because that's their people yeah. well let's look maybe at a couple more and this is why i was talking about the flat style this is what i learned at bacon this is the old style we we uh, uh learned there this is the style that originated from uh, old uh, pictograph drawings and uh, uh, the old style drawings and ledger artwork uh, it evolved into this in the early, early part of last century. Um, we had Indians have been painting or doing our art on materials like paper and canvases for that long. It's fairly new. Uh, we've been doing art since we've been here, since Creator put us down here, we've been artists. But this was a new way of expressing ourselves. And so we took this uh, form and this was pretty popular. Uh, it's what most people think of when they think of Indian art, especially out of Oklahoma. Uh, they call it a, the Bacon School because Bacon College is one of the, the uh, leaders. Uh, you know, the Kiowa Five started at OU doing this, and uh, a lot of the ones that came to Bacon, Blue Eagle, and Dick West, uh, uh, Crumbo, and all those guys that, that studied at uh, OU this style of art, and so it became pretty popular in Oklahoma. It was. This style is fairly popular out in Santa Fe with Dorothy Dunn at the Santa Fe Indian School. Uh, this style was uh, the same out there. There was a lot of little subtle differences to how it was um, between the Kiowa Six and what Bacon did and Dorothy Dunn Studio. Uh, there's differences. And if you know the schools behind the, the pieces, you can tell. Uh, sometimes you can tell by the tribes represented because of the schools where these tribes were like the uh the uh santa fe indian school were mainly southwestern indians navajo your pueblo indians so you'll get that 
those images there, uh, Bay Cone was uh, mostly southeastern Plains Indians, so you'll get, you know, and, uh, but yeah, this is a, this is an example of what they call a flat style. Some call it traditional, but that's kind of frowned on, they call it traditional, uh, because there is, uh, what's, what's traditional, uh, you know, what does that mean? Uh, so they prefer to call it a flat style. Let's look at one more and then we'll, we'll go to Charlotte. <laughs> Oh, and this one, <laughs> I'm an old guy, and so I uh, always loved the uh, 60s concert posters. Love those old psychedelic posters. <laughs> and so uh, one day I decided, you know, I'm going to do, I want to do something like that using that kind of, you know, imagery and, and colors and everything. And I, this is one or two I did. I also did one, uh, a, a gourd dance, a Kiowa gourd dance one. Um, but what I did here was I used Sayakida, which means stomp dance in our language. It's, it's the top word up there going across. Uh, like it was the, the venue or, or uh, like the Fillmore East or whatever or a band was playing. And then, you know, how they'd always have these different bands that were playing like the Doors or Jefferson Airplane or whatever, you know, um, on there in these in that Art Nouveau lettering is what they use. They use a lot of Art Nouveau play posters is what they base those, their 60s concert posters off of. But I use that that lettering and I, those words on there, those names on there are ceremonial grounds, active ceremonial grounds in the Muscogee Nation today in, in our native language. And so they're on there like the band names would be on that poster. And then the image in the center is a, is a stomp dance leader. There's the arbor in the background and then kind of the orange yellowish color represents the, the, the flame, the fire, the, the ceremonial fire. And That's then the amazing. six stars, the, the Pleiades. Um, I did one on that was similar to that, but I don't think I have a picture of it on, as a Kiowa gore dance. And what I did was another one. It's got the gore dancer in the teepee and it's a blue one. And it has, uh, I used the date when Indian Re House Records released the Kiowa gore dance volumes one and two. They recorded it down in Carnegie, Oklahoma in July of 73. And I used that date on the bottom, like it was the date of the concert. And, mm -hmm. and it's done the same way. It's done with the, the Art Nouveau lettering around it. And it's, I wish I had put a picture on so you could see the two, because it's completely different, but it, everybody looks at it and they recognize it right off as that 60s concert poster. And I wanted to do a series, and I may still do it, of different Indian ceremonials and dances mm -hmm. like that, but do it in that 60s concert poster style thing. Um, that was just a my native pop art idea that I was wanting to do kind of like the the uh, the Star Trek one, you know, because uh, I know I do old old things that represent who we are, but we're not stuck in the past. We're moving on in the future. We're still here. So I want to do what we do today and what interests us today as native people. Yeah. And you how you've integrated even COVID-19 into your art. Yeah. Well, we're, we're hitting close to the time. But I wanted to turn to Charlotte to tell us a little bit about the Museum of Native American History. <laughs> well, thank you. We are right here in Northwest Arkansas, and we're next to 39 nations in Oklahoma. Why, you're a mere hour and a half away. Um, it is our honor to be here. We are a private museum that was created by David Bogle. Uh, his heritage is Cherokee. and. His genius of his vision of this museum is to show the diversity of culture of the first people from all the Americas. And so when you come into the museum, you are greeted by a 12,000 year old woolly mammoth uh, and you go chronologically through time and we stop at about 1920. But that is not enough. And just what Johnny says. Now we want to connect the past with present day, you know, cultural leaders that are making history today. I mean, from astronauts to West Studi to our cultural celebration coming up uh, called Indigenuity. In fact, all that chemistry you came up with on the mural is Indigenuity. And that's tradition meets innovation, you know, because um, we want to uh, pass that on because our focus now is to connect future generations where they are they we have indigenous educators beam into your classroom so that's our next big uh thing on the agenda which i'm really excited about but october the um 7th through the 9th is our big cultural celebration and 
you you almost are the same as Dan Wildcat. They make my face hurt. They make me smile so much. But uh, we're taking the coined phrase indigenuity from Professor Dan Wildcat of the Haskell Indian Nation University. And that is a focus for evermore, but also it'll be called indigenuity, a bridge to the future. And what we want to plant that seed in the next generation is that whatever gift you've been given, whatever is in your heart to be your profession, that whether it's an urban planner or an artist, a fashion designer, uh, uh, agriculture, is that you look at what is that return on investment of sustainability for all of our relations? What you're doing, is it going to be good for the air, the water, the land, the plants, the animals? And it is just my honor to be a part of this museum. You never know who will walk through that door. Right. Well, and did you have any uh, slides you wanted to share, Charlotte? I think we sent you a few of what the exterior of the museum looks like. We literally are, uh, Northwest Arkansas and Bentonville, Arkansas is becoming quite the arts district and a destination with the Crystal Bridges Museum of American Art, and they will be expanding and bringing in a, a, a Native American uh, a curator, I think, pretty soon. Hmm. Johnny Diacon. And, um, <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, there's the momentary, there's so much happening right now. It's exciting and it's really uh, incredible, you know, to be a part of that uh, destination of, you know, the arts. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, and then if people are interested in learning more about um, your event uh, in October, uh, where, should they go to your website? It's not up yet, but you can follow us at uh, MONA, which stands for Museum of Native American History dot US. But uh, Mary, you'll be joining us, I'm sure. <laughs> I hope to. I hope to. Well, uh, we're getting close to time. This all went very quickly. Uh, but but any uh, last thoughts you want to leave us all with, Johnny? Oh, I just want to thank everybody that, you know, uh, for the interest in this work, it's like I said, it, it's not about me. It's about the people in the story and that. And, and a lot of times my artwork, I do it for my people. So uh, it's going to be around a lot longer than I am. So it's a record. And I want people to see it. I actually want them. I want them to think of the people more than me. You know what I mean? It's that's that's what I'm doing it for. It's a record. It's for them. I want to say one more thing about it. When you're looking at that mural, you can you can see the wind and you can feel the wind and it's just, it is so powerful. I, I hope that if you are, you know, we are close to us that you'll stop by and it is always our honor to give a platform to people making history today. Well, and let me just ask Charlotte, is the museum open now? It is, this is our fifth week to be open. We've opened a little bit slowly. So we're uh, here Wednesday through Saturday, but I have a feeling in June, we'll probably go back to our regular hours, but it's been great. And uh, we were actually, uh, we'll find out what happens, but we've been nominated one of the top 10 history museums. So we'll see yeah, if we made amazing. it pretty soon. Yeah. Well, so uh, thank you so much uh, to Johnny and to Charlotte and for sharing uh, your wonderful work and the powerful uh, mural. Um, so if you're in Bentonville, Arkansas, or plan to travel there, hopefully you will visit the Museum of Native American History. As for the Mitchell, we are still closed, but we're hoping, uh, we're planning to open this summer. So stay tuned. We hope you visit us as well. And in the meantime, uh, please uh, continue to join both the virtual programming for the Mitchell Museum and um, the Museum of Native American History. So thank you so much to everyone who joined us for this very special presentation tonight. We're so thankful. Thank you, Johnny and Charlotte, and thank you, uh, the Museum of Native American History, and thanks to everyone at the Mitchell Museum, yeah. uh, particularly Josie Starr, who helped this, and Evan Alvarado from the MONA. Thank you so much, everyone. Mary, thank you for your generosity. Thank you. Maro, thank you.